On August 15, 1982, Robert Ainsworth, 41, stepped into his rubber raft and began his descent south down the Green River toward the outer edge of Seattle's city limits. It was a trip he had made on many occasions, yet this time it would be different. As he drifted slowly downstream, he noticed a middle-aged balding man standing by the riverbank and a second, younger man sitting in a nearby pickup truck. Ainsworth suspected that the men were out for a day's fishing. He asked the older man if he had caught anything. The man replied that he had not. According to Smith and Gullen's book, The Search for the Green River Killer, the man standing then asked Ainsworth if he found anything, to which Ainsworth replied, Just this old single tree. Soon after, the two men left in the old pickup truck, and Ainsworth continued to float down the river. Moments later, he found himself surrounded by death. As he peered into the clear waters, his gaze was met by staring eyes. A young black woman's face was floating just beneath the surface of the water, her body swaying beneath her with the current. Believing it might be a mannequin, Ainsworth attempted to snag the figure with a pole. Accidentally, the raft overturned as he tried to dislodge the figure from a rock, and Ainsworth fell into the river. To his horror, he realized that the figure was not a mannequin, but a dead woman. Seconds later, he saw another floating corpse of a half-nude black woman partially submerged in the water. Quickly, Ainsworth swam towards the riverbank where the truck stood earlier. In shock, he sat down and waited for help to arrive. Within a half hour, he noticed a man with two children on bicycles. He stopped them, told them of his gruesome discovery, and asked them to get the police. Before long, a policeman arrived at the scene and questioned Ainsworth about his find. The officer disbelievingly walked into the shallow river and reached out toward the ghostly form. The officer immediately called for backup. Soon after reinforcements arrived at the scene, detectives sealed off the area and began to search for evidence. During the search, a detective made another macabre discovery. He found a third body, that of a young girl who was partially clothed. Unlike the other two girls, this one was found in a grassy area less than 30 feet from where the other victims lay in the water. It was obvious that she had died from asphyxiation. The girl had a pair of blue pants knotted around her neck. She also showed signs of a struggle because she had bruises on her arms and legs. She was later identified as Opal Mills, 16. It was believed that she had been murdered within 24 hours of her discovery. Following an examination of the bodies at the scene, Chief Medical Examiner Donald Ray determined that all three girls died of strangulation. The two girls found in the water, later identified as Marcia Chapman, 31, and Cynthia Hines, 17, were both found to have pyramid-shaped rocks lodged in their vaginal cavities. They were both held down by rocks in the water. Ray further determined that Chapman, a mother of two who had gone missing two weeks earlier, had been dead for over a week. She had shown advanced signs of decomposition. However, Hines was believed to have been in the river for a period of only several days. The three bodies were not the only ones to be found in and around Washington State's Green River. Several days earlier, the body of a woman named Deborah Bonner was discovered. Her nude body had been found slumped over a log in the Green River. She, too, had been strangled to death. Just a month earlier, another young girl, identified as Wendy Lee Caulfield, was found strangled and floating in the Green River. Moreover, six months prior to Caulfield's discovery, the body of her friend, Leanne Wilcox, was found several miles from the river in an empty lot. It was not believed that the Green River killer murdered Wilcox, Within the space of six months, six bodies had been discovered in or near the river. The police detectives at the scene quickly realized that there was a serial killer on the loose. They knew that they had to find and catch him as soon as possible before any more women disappeared. A special task force was assembled of King County detectives to investigate the Green River murders. According to the Seattle Times, it was the largest police task force ever assembled since the Ted Bundy murders less than a decade earlier. Major Richard Kraske, the head of the Criminal Investigation Division, and Detective Dave Reichart of the King County Major Crime Squad led the team. They enlisted the help of FBI serial killer profile John Douglas and criminal investigator Bob Keppel, who was known for his unique and successful approach of compiling evidence in the Ted Bundy case eight years earlier. The investigation got off to a shaky start because a massive influx of information swamped the police force within a relatively short period of time. They simply did not have the means to process the ever-increasing amount of data and evidence, and much of it was lost, misplaced, or overlooked entirely. 
In fact, the situation got so bad that at one point they enlisted the help of volunteers to assist the police in the ongoing investigation. During their investigation, detectives learned that many of the murdered girls knew each other and shared a similar history of prostitution. Investigators decided to begin their search for the killer in the area where the girls were known to frequent. They conducted hundreds of interviews with many prostitutes who worked the main strip in Seattle, stretching from South 139th Street to South 272nd Street. Investigators tried to obtain information on any suspicious characters they might have encountered. However, many of the girls were reluctant to talk because of their blatant mistrust for the police. One of the prostitutes who worked the strip filed a report with police, stating that a man who raped her made reference to the Green River murders. Soon after the report, the task force began to search for the assailant. On August 20, 1982, the police announced that they had him in custody as a potential suspect in the Green River murders. However, they were unable to find any plausible evidence connecting him with the crime. He was eventually released and the search resumed for the killer. There were other prostitutes who filed reports with the police that were of special concern to the task force. It was believed that the reports could be related to the Green River murders. Interviews taken by two separate prostitutes claimed that a man in a blue and white truck abducted them and attempted to kill them. According to one account by Susan Widmark, 21, a middle-aged man in a blue and white truck solicited her. Once Widmark was in his truck, he pointed a pistol to her head and sped off toward the highway. He took her to a desolate road, turned off the engine, and proceeded to violently rape her. Following the rape, he allowed her to dress while he began to drive away from the scene with her still in the car. While driving, he made reference to the recent river murders while continuing to hold a gun to her head. Fearing for her life, she managed to escape from the vehicle while at a stoplight. Widmark was able to make out part of the registration number of the truck before the man sped away. A similar incident happened to Deborah Estes, 15, who filed a report with police in late August 1982 concerning a Estes told police that she was walking down the highway when a man in a blue and white pickup truck approached her and offered her a ride. She accepted and climbed into the vehicle. To her amazement, the man pulled a pistol out and pointed it at her head. He violently forced her to give him oral sex before releasing her into the woods, handcuffed and driving off. She immediately fled the scene, looking for help. Seeing an emerging pattern that could have been related to the Green River murders, the task force decided to follow the lead and search for the truck and driver. They hoped that new information concerning the man would lead them to a break in the case. That September, a meat butcher named Charles Clinton Clark was pulled over in his blue and white truck while driving along Seattle's main strip. After a background check was conducted, it was learned that Clark owned two handguns. Investigators believed that Clark might be the man they were looking for. They obtained his driver's license photo and showed it to both Widmark and Estes. Both women positively identified Clark as their attacker. Clark was arrested and his house and vehicle were searched. The police found two handguns that were allegedly used in the assaults. After interrogation by police, Clark admitted to attacking the women. However, there was speculation as to whether he was the Green River Killer because he was known to release his victims following an attack. Moreover, Clark had a solid alibi during the time many of the Green River victims disappeared. When Clark was being booked with the rape of Widmark and Estes, 19-year-old Mary Bridget Meehan disappeared during a walk. Meehan was more than eight months pregnant and went missing near the Western Six Motel. The motel was located on the Strip and was a frequent hangout and workplace for many of the prostitutes that fell victim to the Green River Killer. Based on a hunch, Detective Reichert began to suspect that one of the volunteer civilians working on the case might be the Green River Killer. A 44-year-old out-of-work taxi driver became the focus of the investigation and was vigorously interviewed by the police. They were concerned because two weeks prior to Mian's disappearance, two 16-year-old girls, Kaysan Lee and Terry Renee Milligan, mysteriously disappeared. They too were thought to have a history of prostitution. It was suspected that they had fallen victim to the Green River Killer. The taxi driver seemed to fit the profile of the killer devised by FBI agent Sean Douglas. According to Douglas, the Green River Killer was a confident yet impulsive middle-aged man who would most likely frequent the murder scenes in order to reenact the crimes in his mind. The killer was probably familiar with the area and was likely to have deep religious convictions. Moreover, Douglas believed that he might have an active interest in police work, especially the investigation into the recent murders. The killer might even contact the police in an effort to assist in the ongoing investigation. 
During most of the winter of 1982, police heavily monitored the taxi driver's movements, although he continuously denied having anything to do with the Green River murders. The taxi driver eventually became the primary suspect in the killings. He was arrested for unpaid parking tickets because investigators had no solid evidence connecting him to the murders, except that he knew five of the victims. On September 26, 1982, the decomposing remains of a 17-year-old prostitute named Giselle A. Lavorne were discovered. She had gone missing for more than two months before a biker found her nude body near abandoned houses south of the SeaTac International Airport. She had been strangled to death by a pair of men's black socks. Intriguingly, at the time of her disappearance, she was blonde, yet when her body was discovered, her hair was dyed black. Although her body was not found in the direct vicinity of the now infamous river, police believe that she was a victim of the Green River Killer. Between September 1982 and April 1983, approximately 14 girls disappeared. Those missing included Mary Meehan, Deborah Estes, Denise Bush, Shwanda Summers, Shirley Sherrill, Rebecca Marrero, Colleen Brockman, Alma Smith, Dolores Williams, Gail Matthews, Andrea Childers, Sandra Gabbert, Kimi Kai Pitsor, and Marie Malvar. Most of the girls, ages ranging from between 15 and 23 years old, were known prostitutes who frequented the strip. The Green River Task Force's attention was temporarily drawn to one possible suspect allegedly involved in the disappearance of the last girl to go missing, Marie Malvar. On April 30, 1983, Malvar's boyfriend saw her talking with a potential customer in a dark-colored truck as she was soliciting on the strip. The boyfriend claimed that he saw Malvar get into the truck before it sped away. According to Smith and Gullen, Malvar's boyfriend stated that Malvar and the unknown man seemed to be engaged in an argument. Suspicious of the driver of the truck, the boyfriend followed them. Before long, the truck with his girlfriend in it gave chase and eventually disappeared when the boyfriend was held up by stoplight. It was the last time he ever saw his girlfriend. He later notified the police of Malvar's disappearance. Less than a week after the incident, he, along with Malvar's father and brother, spotted the suspicious truck near the place where he initially lost sight of it days earlier. They followed the truck to a house located on South 348th Street and called the police. The police eventually arrived at the house and spoke with the owner, Gary Ridgeway, who denied having ever seen Malvar. Satisfied, the police left the residence and failed to pursue the matter any further. A similar truck to that owned by Ridgeway was also involved in the April disappearance of a young prostitute named Kimi Kai Pitzer. While in the process of turning a trick, Pitzer's pimp saw her getting into a dark green pickup truck with an attached camper. He described the driver of the vehicle as having a pockmarked face. He watched as the two drove off and he never saw Pitzer again. He later informed police, but the information concerning Pitzor's disappearance and Malvar's was never fully connected. By the spring of 1983, the investigation into the Green River Killer and related murders was collapsing. The task force detectives realized that the probability of the taxi driver being the killer was low, yet they continued to keep him as a prime suspect. They had no new leads, and prostitutes continued to rapidly disappear throughout the city. Inundated with an avalanche of tips, the task force was unable to keep up with a massive influx of information. They enlisted the help of Bob Keppel to help organize the mountain of information. In late April, Keppel spent three months going through all the information available pertaining to the murders believed to have been attributed to the Green River Killer. Upon completion of his analysis, he compiled a report for the Sheriff of King County, Vern Thomas. To the task force's dismay, the report was highly critical of the ongoing investigation. According to Keppel in his book, The River Man, if the killer was to be found, many changes needed to be made. The report compiled by Keppel stated that most of the data, including evidence, files, and witness accounts connected to the crimes, were in total disarray. The first thing that was needed was a complete reorganization and accurate categorization of all the data. Then, once that was completed, similarities and dissimilarities among the cases needed to be identified in order to find common threads possibly connecting the murders to one or more killers. There was no doubt that a successful and thorough investigation would cost the county a lot more time and money than they previously expected. Already, the investigation was the largest operation in the history of the country. The amount of money needed to implement Keppel's suggestions would far exceed the estimated $2 million. However, something needed to be done in an effort to stop the murderous rampages of the killer. On May 8, 1983, another body was discovered that was later identified as Carol Ann Christensen, 21. 
Her remains were found by a family hunting for mushrooms in a wooded area near Maple Valley. When Christensen's body was found, the killer displayed her corpse in an unusually gruesome way. Christensen was found with her head covered by a brown paper bag. When it was removed, it was found that she had a fish carefully placed on top of her neck. Smith and Gullen state that the killer also placed another fish on her left breast and a bottle between her legs. Her hands were placed crossed over her stomach and freshly ground beef was placed on top of her left hand. Further examination revealed that she was strangled with a cord. Intriguingly, she also showed signs of having been in water at some point, even though the river was miles away. The task force speculated that she was yet another victim of the Green River Killer. During the spring and summer of 1983, nine more young women, many of whom were prostitutes, disappeared. Those missing included Martina Otherly and Cheryl Lee Wims, 18, Yvonne Antosh, 19, Carrie Royce, 15, Constance Neon, 21, Tammy Lillies, 16, Kelly McGuinness, 18, Tina Thompson, 22, and April Buttram, 17. A majority of the girls were placed on the ever-growing list of possible Green River Killer murders. However, there were some who did not make the list because they were found outside of the parameters where the Green River Killer was known to dump many of the bodies. That summer, several more bodies were discovered. In June, the unidentified remains, which were believed to be of a 17- to 19-year-old white woman, was found on Southwest Tualatin Road. On August 11th, the body of missing Shonda Summers was discovered near the SeaTac Airport. One day later, the remains of another body, which remained unidentified, was found at the SeaTac Airport North site. The fall and winter of 1983 would also yield as many disappearances and even more corpses. Between September and December of 1983, nine more women went missing and seven bodies were discovered, all of whom were believed to have been abducted and murdered by the Green River Killer. The missing women, who were mostly prostitutes, included Debbie Abernathy, 26, Tracy Ann Winston, 18, Patricia Osborne and Maureen Feeney, Mary Sue Bellow, 25, Pammy A. Vent, 16, Delise Plasier, 22, Kim Nelson, 26, and Lisa Lorraine Yates. Those whose bodies were discovered included Dolores Williams, 17, who had gone missing March 8, 1983. Her remains were discovered on September 18 at Star Lake. That same day, the remains of Gail Matthews, 23, were also discovered at Star Lake. Over the next few months, the bodies of five more women were discovered. On October 15th, the skeletal remains of Yvonne Antosh, who was last seen on May 31st, was found near Seuss Creek on Auburn Black Diamond Road. She was one of the few victims to have had a missing persons report filed on her. Twelve days later, the partially buried skeleton of Constance Neon was found in an area south of SeaTac Airport. The task force investigators believed that there were probably more bodies to be found in that area, so they decided to conduct a search with the assistance of a team of teenaged explorer Boy Scouts. On October 29th, during a sweep of the empty lots surrounding the airport, one of the scouts found a skeleton covered with trash beneath some bushes. The remains were later identified as Kelly Ware, 22. The killer's deadly rampage claimed two more victims whose bodies were discovered before the new year. On November 13th, following an extensive search of several lots surrounding an area south of SeaTac near South 192nd Street, the badly decomposed remains of Mary Meehan and her unborn baby were found. According to the Cold Serial website, Meehan and her child were the only victims attributed to the Green River Killer who were fully buried. Several unexplainable items were found on or close to the body, including two small pieces of plastic, a large clump of hair near the pubic region of the body, a patch of skin attached to the skull, which contained fibers on it, three small bones, two halved yellow pencils, and clear plastic tubing. One month later, on December 15th, the skull of Kimi Kai Pitsor was found in Auburn, Washington, near Mountain View Cemetery. It seemed as if the killer found a new burial site to place his victims. It would be the fifth known dumping ground used for the disposal of the bodies. Two weeks following Pitzer's discovery, the Green River Task Force increased by more than half due to the increasing numbers of murders in the area. It was feared many more murders would occur in the coming months. Their predictions would prove to be correct. Although the official count of Green River victims was estimated at the time to be 11 or 12, the number has been, and continues to be, challenged. The precise number to this day remains unclear, and it's believed to be much higher than initially estimated. Near the final months of 1983, there were approximately 18 bodies discovered in the Seattle region. 
Many victims were not included on the list, even though they were killed in very nearly the same fashion as the other victims. There was no explanation given as to why the women were excluded from the list. In January 1984, the Green River Task Force came under new leadership, headed by Captain Frank Adamson, who previously headed the police department's internal affairs unit. During the first few months of Adamson's assignment, drastic changes took place. He first decided that it would be in the investigation's best interest to relocate the task force headquarters to the Burien County Precinct, which was near the airport and closer to where the crimes were occurring. Following Keppel's advice, Adamson divided up various tasks and assigned them to individuals within the team. It was believed that this method would facilitate a more thorough organization, integration, and assemblage of the vast amounts of information and lead to more successful results in the case. Smith and Gullen stated that one team composed of seven investigators and one sergeant team leader was assigned to handle the victims of the Green River Killer. Another team of similar construction was assigned to information pertaining to probable suspects. Adamson then assigned three detectives to a newly constructed crime analysis section, whose duties involved the follow-up of leads and analysis of possible trends and methodologies utilized by the killer, as well as other pertinent information relevant to the case. 22 police officers were also assigned to the task force's Protect Proactive Squad, which developed new strategies to monitor prostitute activities on the Strip and any unusual events or dealings in the area. Moreover, a new strategy was imposed by Keppel that changed the investigator's focus from a suspect's possible guilt to the suspect's possible innocence. The implication of this strategy allowed investigators to quickly eliminate people under suspicion who had alibis and instead concentrate on more probable suspects. The suspects that remained were prioritized according to their threat. Those that were most closely linked to victims fit the profile of the killer and his movements were put in Category A. Those who were less closely linked with the crimes were assigned to Categories B or C before being eventually eliminated. Just when it seemed as if the newly revised task force was better prepared to capture the Green River Killer, the inevitable occurred. On February 14, 1984, the skeletal remains of a woman, who was later identified as Denise Louise Plager, were discovered 40 miles from the city close to Interstate 90. She was the first victim to be found that year, but not the last. Over the next two months, approximately nine more bodies would be found. Some of those found included those of Cheryl Wims, 18, Lisa Yates, 26, Debbie Abernathy, Terry Milligan, 16, Sandra Gabbert, 17, and Alma Smith, 22. The other victims remained unidentified. Most of the girls had one primary thing in common, a history of prostitution. Although it appeared as if the Green River Task Force was making few advances in the investigation, distinct patterns began to emerge that allowed the team to create a more accurate profile of the killer and his movements. The killer seemed to have several dumping grounds where he would dispose of the bodies of his victims. With the exception of Meehan, the bodies that were discovered were found partially buried or covered with garbage or foliage. Most of the bodies had been found off isolated roads in or near illegal waste dumping areas. The FBI's profiler, John Douglas, concluded that the bodies were dumped in the areas because the killer thought of the women as human garbage. During 1983, dumping grounds moved away from the river and concentrated mostly around the SeaTac Airport and Star Lake. In 1984, the victims' remains were concentrated in the areas of Mountain View Cemetery and North Bend, off of or near to Interstate 90. The victims were also disappearing from two primary areas, the Strip and the downtown area of Seattle. The task force worked under the assumption that the killer worked or lived close to the area where he was disposing the bodies. The task force determined that the areas where the bodies were found, when plotted on a map, roughly formed a triangular shape. It was believed that the killer might live somewhere within that triangle. An important discovery was also made in April when the skeletal remains of some of the victims were found. Shoe impressions, possibly that of the killer, were revealed when investigators removed the brush that partially concealed the bodies. Upon examination of the prints, investigators learned that they were made by a size 10 or 11 man's walking shoe. It was a vital piece of evidence that could connect the killer with his victims. In mid-April, a volunteer task force worker and psychic, Barbara Cubic Pattern, had a vision that another woman's body would be found close to Interstate 90. Cubic Pattern immediately contacted the police and told them about her vision, but became increasingly frustrated when they failed to act on the new information. Taking matters into her own hands, she and her daughter set out to find the woman. Following the leads revealed by her vision, Cubic Pattern and her daughter eventually came across another body. 
Immediately after the discovery, the two women drove to a nearby search area that was paroled by the police. When she informed one of the officers of her discovery, she was rebuffed and even threatened with arrest for obstruction of the guarded perimeter. Angered, Cubic Pattern informed reporters that were stationed nearby of her discovery. Finally, members of the task force approached her as she talked with the reporters and asked her to show them the body. Shortly thereafter, the police were confronted with a gruesome discovery. The decomposing remains were that of Amina Agashev, 36. She was last seen on July 7, 1982 at a restaurant in downtown Seattle. Agashev did not fit the description of many of the other victims. She was older than the other victims and a waitress, not a prostitute. Agashev was also in a stable relationship at the time of her disappearance and was a mother of two. Although there were obvious differences between Agashev's lifestyle and those of the other victims and the location of where her body was disposed, investigators believe that she was the victim of the Green River Killer. Moreover, she was listed as one of the killer's first victims, even though several murders prior to her disappearance matched the M.O. of the killer. On May 26, two children playing on Javita Road in Pierce County were shocked when they discovered a skeleton. The police and task force were immediately alerted to the new finding. Following a medical examination, it was discovered that the remains were that of 15-year-old runaway Colleen Brockman. Investigators still had no leads to the identity of the killer, apart from the location of the bodies and the shoe print. After almost three years, the murderous killing spree continued. Following the discovery of Brockman, the rash of murders seemed to be diminishing. However, the desire to catch the killer remained a top priority for the task force. In August 1984, investigators believed their big break in the case arrived when two criminals in a San Francisco jail confessed to the Green River murders. After extensive interviews with the two prisoners, the confessions were determined to be a hoax. Several months later, the infamous serial killer Ted Bundy offered from his prison cell on death row to assist Keppel on the task force in finding their man. Bundy offered his old antagonist a rare glimpse into the mind of a serial killer, an offer that Keppel could not refuse. The two men conversed mostly via letters, where Keppel asked detailed questions that he hoped Bundy could answer. Much of the information that Keppel received greatly interested Keppel and the task force investigators. Bundy suggested that the killer knew his victims, probably even befriending them before he lured them to their deaths. According to Keppel's book, The River Man, Bundy suggested that the killer likely disposed of even more bodies where they found the most recent ones. Moreover, he believed the disposal pattern of the bodies led closer to the killer's home. Bundy was able to give unusual insight from a killer's perspective, much of which was helpful to the case. The information received from Bundy assisted the detectives in their general understanding of serial killer behavior. In fact, Bundy became one of the primary consultants, next to Douglas and Keppel, that contributed to the buildup of the killer's profile. Despite this unusual advice, the task force remained stymied as to the identity of the Green River Killer. Although the murders seemed to have slowly diminished, they did not cease altogether. Between October and December 1984, two more bodies, identified as Mary Sue Bellow, 25, and Martina Otherly, 18, were discovered. Both bodies were found off of Highway 410. The total body count had climbed to 31, although only 28 of the victims actually made it on the ever-growing official Green River murder list. Fourteen women were still believed to be missing. On March 10, 1985, another partially buried body was found near Star Lake Road. The victim was eventually identified as Carrie Ross, 15. She disappeared during the summer of 1983. In mid-June, a man bulldozing a patch of land in Tigard, Oregon, discovered the skeletal remains of two more women. The remains were later identified as Denise Bush, 23, and Shirley Sherrill, 19. Both girls were known prostitutes in Seattle. The discovery of the two women confirmed the fact that the Green River Killer's parameters had extended out of state. It seemed as if a new dumping ground had been revealed. Meanwhile, FBI profiler John Douglas reevaluated the previous profile of the killer and came to a new conclusion that there were two separate killers. Douglas suggested that, although the profiles of both killers were similar in many ways, the way in which they disposed of the bodies slightly differed. To Douglas, it seemed as if one of the killers went to greater effort to conceal the bodies than the other. Whereas some of the bodies were partially covered or buried in isolated areas, other bodies lay openly exposed to detection, such as those found in the Green River. Although the theory seemed to be plausible, there were no suspects available that could support his theory. 
The case had run cold, and no likely suspects could be connected with any of the murders. Pressure mounted on the task force for its inability to capture the killer, or killers, after more than three years. It was not until the winter that the skeletal remains of yet three more victims were found. The first remains were identified as those belonging to Mary West, which were found in a wooded area in Seward Park in Seattle. The other two remains were that of Kimikai Pitsur and another unidentified white female between 14 and 19 years old. The unusual aspect of this more recent discovery was that Pitsur's remains had been located in two different locations. In December 1983, her skull was discovered in Mountain View Cemetery, and two years later, the remainder of her body was found a short distance away in a ravine. It could have been possible that an animal dragged the skull from the body sometime after death. However, there was no evidence that this occurred. The police believed it was the work of the killer. Investigators were uncertain as to the killer's motive for dividing the body between the two different locations. They speculated that it was done to taunt the police or confuse the investigation. In February 1986, the Green River Task Force seemed to get the break it had been hoping for. A man described by investigators as a person of interest was brought into the police station and searched. The event received a great deal of media attention. An FBI agent and Detective Jim Doyton of the task force extensively questioned the new suspect. However, before long, they realized he was not the man they were looking for. Shortly thereafter, the man was released. During this time, the public became increasingly aware of the task force's lack of results. Thus far, there had been several suspects taken into custody, and each one proved to have no connection with the murders. Public anger and fear reached a boiling point. The media referred to the Green River Task Force as a joke. To make matters worse, that summer, the skeletal remains of three more women were discovered off of I-90, east of Seattle. The remains were those of Maureen Feeney, 19, Kim Nelson, 26, and another unidentifiable young woman. Feeney was the only one of the three that investigators were able to link to a career in prostitution. The number of victims was quickly climbing towards a staggering 40. By the end of 1986, the staff had been reduced by 40% and Adamson was reassigned to another project. Captain James Pompey became the new leader of the Green River Task Force. Pompey immediately began to reorganize the team and the data related to the investigation. Just as Pompey was beginning to get started, two more bodies were discovered in December. This time, the bodies were found much further away than expected, in an area north of Vancouver, British Columbia. Yet again, the killers seemed to be taunting investigators. Even more intriguing was that the partial remains of several other women had been scattered alongside the bodies of the two women. Even though the bodies were located a great distance from the others, there was no doubt in the investigators' minds that the work was that of the Green River Killer. In the beginning months of 1987, investigators had a new suspect in relation to the Green River murders. Previously known to police, the newest suspect had been picked up for attempting to solicit an undercover police officer posing as a prostitute in May 1984. However, the man was released after he successfully passed a lie detector test. When investigators looked deeper into the man's past, they discovered that he had been accused of choking a prostitute in 1980 near the SeaTac International Airport. Yet, the man pleaded self-defense after claiming the woman bit him and he was soon after released from police custody. One of the task force detectives, Matt Haney, was highly suspicious of this suspect and decided to dive even further into the man's history. He discovered that the police had at one time stopped and questioned the man back in 1982 when he was in his truck with a prostitute. The investigator learned that the prostitute he was with was one of the women on the Green River murder list, Kelly McGinnis. Moreover, the police approached the man again in 1983 in connection with the kidnapping of murder victim Marie Malvar. A witness, Malvar's boyfriend, followed the truck to the suspect's house after recognizing it as the one he had last saw his girlfriend in. Haney believed he might be on to the Green River Killer. Haney learned from the man's ex-wife that he often frequented the dump sites where many of the bodies had been discovered. Also, several prostitutes claimed to have seen a man matching the suspect's description regularly cruising the strip between 1982 and 1983. It turned out that the man passed the strip almost daily on his way to work. Some of the most damning evidence discovered was that the man, who worked as a truck painter, was found to have been absent or off-duty on every occasion a victim disappeared. Finally, on April 8, 1987, the police obtained a warrant and searched the man's house. 
According to the Seattle Times, the police also took bodily samples of the suspect so that they could compare them with the evidence they had from the Green River victims. However, there was insufficient evidence to arrest him, and the man was released from police custody. The suspect was identified as Gary Ridgway. Several weeks following Ridgway's release, Captain Pompey died from a massive heart attack related to a scuba diving accident. The unfortunate event was picked up by the media and sensationalized. It was suggested that the Green River Killer was actually a police officer that murdered Pompey, regardless of the fact that there was absolutely no substantiating evidence to support the theory. One newspaper even called for an official investigation into the death of Pompey. It seemed as if the public's nerves had become so raw after so much death in the city. The task force, which was now led by Captain Greg Boyle, was called once again in June. Three boys stumbled across the partially buried skeletal remains of a young woman while searching for aluminum cans. The girl, who was identified as Cindy Ann Smith, 17, was found in a ravine behind the Green River Community College. She had been missing for approximately three years before her discovery. More bodies of missing young women were discovered in the year that followed, some of which included that of missing runaway Debbie Gonzalez, 14, and Deborah Estes, 15, who disappeared six years earlier. Their deaths were attributed to the Green River Killer. Although there were still bodies being discovered, there were no recent killings attributed to the Green River Killer in the Seattle region. In 1988, the discovery of more than 20 bodies of prostitutes in San Diego led to the belief that the Green River Killer moved and continued his murderous rampage in California. Detective Reichert and the new task force commander, Bob Evans, temporarily joined forces with the San Diego Police Department in an effort to find the killer. In December 1988, investigators had a new suspect. A man named William J. Stevens caught the attention of the police after several callers phoned him in as a potential suspect during the airing of the popular true crime detective show, Crime Stoppers. Stevens was a prison escapee who was on the run for eight years after a two-year stint behind bars for burglary. At the time he was rediscovered by police, he was enrolled at the University of Washington as a pharmacology student. As task force investigators delved into Stevens's past, they learned that he was already a suspect in the Green River killings. It was also learned that Stevens had a blatant contempt for prostitutes and was known to have, on several occasions, talked about murdering them. When police searched his home, they found masses of firearms, several driver's licenses, credit cards and assumed names, and sexually explicit nude photos of prostitutes. Stevens was highly involved in robbery and credit card fraud, which he used to survive. Task force investigators exhaustively interviewed Stevens about the Green River murders and searched the premises of his home throughout the summer and fall of 1989. Investigators even searched Stevens' father's home for clues tying him to any of the murders. However, nothing was found linking him to the murders. Moreover, credit card records and photographs produced by Stevens' brother provided a tight alibi against his involvement with the crimes. According to the numerous records and receipts, Stevens was traveling across the country during the summer months of 1982 when many of the murders occurred. Eventually, Stevens was cleared of all involvement in the Green River murders. In October 1989, two more skeletal remains of young women were found. One of the victims, identified as Andrea Childers, was found in a vacant lot near Star Lake and 55th Avenue South. Like many of the young women found before her, the cause of death remained unclear due to the state of decomposition. In early 1990, the skull of Denise Bush was found in a wooded area in Southgate Park in Tukwila, Washington. The remainder of Bush's body was located in Oregon five years earlier. Once again, it seemed as if the killer was purposefully moving the bones around in an effort to confuse investigators. Task force investigators were beginning to believe that the killer had defeated them. Morale among the officers was at an all-time low. According to the Seattle Times, in July 1991, the task force was reduced to just one investigator named Tom Jensen. After nine years, roughly 49 victims, and $15 million, the task force still had not caught the Green River Killer. The investigation became known as the country's largest unsolved murder case. The case remained dormant for 10 years. In April 2001, almost 20 years after the first known Green River murder, Detective Reichardt, who had become the sheriff of King County, began renewed investigations into the murders. It was a case he refused to let go of, and he remained determined to find the killer. This time, the task force had technology on their side. 
Reichert formed a new task force team, initially consisting of six members, including DNA and forensic experts, and a couple of detectives. It wasn't long before the force grew to more than 30 people. All the evidence from the murder examination was re-examined, and some of the forensic samples were sent to the labs. The first samples to be sent to the lab were found with three victims that were murdered between 1982 and 1983. Opal Mills, Marcia Chapman, and Carol Christensen. The samples consisted of semen supposedly taken from the killer. The semen samples underwent a newly developed DNA testing method and were compared with samples taken from Ridgeway in April 1987. On September 10, 2001, Reichardt received news from the labs that reduced the hardened detective to tears. There was a match found between the semen samples taken from the victims and Ridgeway. On November 30th, Ridgeway was intercepted by investigators on his way home from work and arrested on four counts of aggravated murder. The charges included that of the three girls and also Cynthia Hines, in which circumstantial evidence was also found connecting him with her death. The man that investigators had sought for 20 years was finally in police custody. This time, they wouldn't let him go. Ridgeway, originally born in Salt Lake City, Utah, on February 18, 1949, worked for a computer company at the time of his arrest. During the time of the murders, he was employed as a truck painter for 30 years at the Kentworth Truck Factory in Renton, Washington. Ridgeway owned many trucks during that time, one of which was of special interest to investigators. According to Seattle's King 5 television station, a 1977 black Ford F-150 owned by the suspect allegedly was connected with some of the victims. According to Time Magazine's Terry McCarthy, Ridgway had an unusual sexual appetite. His three ex-wives and several old girlfriends told the reporter that he was sexually insatiable, demanding sex several times a day. Oftentimes, he would want to have sex in a public area or in the woods, even in the areas where some of the bodies had been discovered. Ridgway was also known to have been obsessed with prostitutes, a fixation that bordered on a love-hate relationship. Neighbors knew him to constantly complain about prostitutes conducting business in his neighborhood, but at the same time, he frequently took advantage of their favors. It was possible that he was torn by his uncontrollable lusts and his staunch religious beliefs. McCarthy states that according to one of his wives, he became a religious fanatic, oftentimes crying following sermons and reading the Bible. Evidence continued to be gathered from Ridgeway in connection with the Green River murder case. Although he pleaded not guilty on all counts in the preliminary hearings, it was suspected that evidence would prove otherwise. Ridgway's attorney, Tom Savage, expected a trial sometime in 2004. Prosecutors intended to seek the death penalty. Ridgway remained interned in jail, awaiting his fate. Millions around the world waited for one question to be answered. Is Ridgway the only Green River killer? On November 5, 2003, Gary Ridgway, 54, avoided the death penalty in King County, Washington, by confessing to the murders of 48 women, most of whom were murdered in the 1982-84 timeframe. The deal Ridgway made was to cooperate with authorities on closing these cases in exchange for 48 life sentences without the possibility of parole. His formal sentencing occurred in January of 2004. However, because some of the victims were buried and possibly killed in Oregon and other areas outside King County, Ridgway could face the death penalty in other jurisdictions. Families of the victims are angry. They had been led to believe that the prosecutors would seek the death penalty, but instead, capital punishment was plea bargained away. Also, legal scholars are wondering about whether this case signals the end of the death penalty in Washington state. If a man who premeditatedly murdered 48 women doesn't get the death penalty, then who is eligible for it? A typical psychopath, Ridgway forgot his victims, had a hard time keeping them straight, never learned their names, and wrote them off as a vicarious thrill, never personalizing them at all. They were throwaways to Ridgway, disposable women. I killed some of them outside. I remember leaving each woman's body in the place where she was found, he said. I killed most of them in my house near Military Road, and I killed a lot of them in my truck not far from where I picked them up. He claims that they were all killed in King County, hoping that prosecutors outside King County will buy it and not prosecute him. Ridgway's contempt for women in general, and prostitutes in particular, was clear in his plea bargain statement. I pick prostitutes as my victims because I hate most prostitutes, and I did not want to pay them for sex. I also picked prostitutes as victims because they were easy to pick up without being noticed.
I knew they would not be reported missing right away and might never be reported missing. I picked prostitutes because I thought I could kill as many of them as I wanted without getting caught. Ridgway exhibited typical serial killer behavior when he expressed his interest in reliving the murder experience, which gave him the sense of empowerment that he lacked in his everyday life. He buried his victims in clusters so that he could drive by and remember the cluster and the pleasure he experienced in the murders of those victims. King County officials wanted to create the impression that this plea bargain brings closure to the case. But it did not. There was something a bit fishy here. We are led to believe that Ridgway went into a killing frenzy in the 1982-84 period and then stopped completely until he murdered once more in 1990 and then once again in 1998. Unfortunately, that is not usually what happens in the world of a serial killer. They can slow down, especially when there is a great deal of police activity, but not really stop. Are we to believe that he really went so long without killing after 1984 when he killed some 46 women in just a few years? Our expectation is that there were many more victims buried within and outside of King County. It took many years to find the bodies that were part of this plea bargain. It may take many more years to find the rest of them. It's not really over yet. Thank you.